as our panel gets prepared to uh, share with you their uh, discussion, their expertise on the issue of economic empowerment, it's my delight to introduce to you the panel moderator, Malika Kapoor. Malika Kapoor is CNN's um, Mumbai-based international correspondent. She is a woman of great bravery and courage in her reporting on issues associated with sexual violence of all kinds. You will note and remember her face from CNN's extraordinary coverage of the brutal gang rape in New Delhi in December 2012 and the, and the um, widespread um, reporting that was led by Malika um, in the aftermath of that as well. You will notice that she has had extensive um, reporting on the Freedom Project, CNN's Freedom Project, their initiative to uncover the issues of sex trafficking and human bonded labor, um, and continues to for a number of years. Um, in fact, Malika was one of the first people um, that I spoke to when we were starting to um, think about the idea of creating an organization called Emancipation, and was an advisor to me at that time. Malika's documentary film, Trapped by Tradition, is a must-see for anyone who is interested in the issue of sexual violence against women and children in this country. You must find it. It has been awarded several awards internationally and domestically. Um, she is um, very um, quiet about her many accomplishments. I'll let you read some more. But one of them that I must um, recognize um, as a friend with a little bit of insight, I may. Malika's extraordinary commitment extends to putting herself in harm's way to bring to the forefront the issues that we're starting to discuss as a society. It's because of people like Malika leading this charge, shedding a light on a problem that most of us would rather never know about. It's because of this brave work that she does. She puts herself and her family in harm's way in order to do this. And it is with my great respect, appreciation, and admiration for Malika that I have her representing, or excuse me, uh, moderating this very important and distinguished panel. We thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn the table to Malika to introduce the rest of her panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much. It's a very kind introduction. You know, when people find out I work for CNN, I get lots of um, various reactions. But one of them I do get often is, wow, you're, you're really lucky. And then I think about it, and you know what? I think I am fortunate because my job allows me to go to places and to meet people um, a lot of you, a lot of people wouldn't normally get the chance to do. But then I have to remind myself that these are also a lot of the places are places where most people wouldn't even want to go to. <laughs> but because of the nature of my job, you know, I have camped outside brothels in red light districts, both in Mumbai and in New Delhi, waiting for a rescue of minor girls. I have traveled to villages and seen extreme levels of brutality amongst the bonded laborers. I have covered the rape cases, both in Mumbai and in Delhi, quite extensively. And almost always, when I take a step back and I look at the root cause of all these evils in our society, it is almost always poverty. Why else would you find in this village near Bharatpur in Rajasthan, you know, the tradition, they say it's been happening for, for generations, so it's okay, that families traffic their daughters. It's because you can't feed them at home. You don't have a situation where you can fill their stomachs, so it's, it's poverty which drives it. If you look at the case of bonded labor, you know, when you, all you own is two bags of rice, and you're giving that to your family with, with salt and onions for months. You don't have a rupee to your name. What are you going to do when a middleman comes and gives you 15,000 rupees in cash and says, this is yours. Now you come halfway across India and work for me. You're going to get up and go. What happens when you're in an abusive marriage and your husband beats and abuses you every night, forces you to have unnatural sex to an extent you have to have surgery so that you can walk again? You have no choice. You don't have money to even get on a bus. You don't have any options. You don't have a job. You don't have land. You don't have a skill set. You have no choice. So we're here today to discuss how we can help the young women of India achieve that level where they have that choice. 
And we're here to discuss whether economic empowerment, whether having a job is enough. And I want to get right to the panel, and I'm going to introduce uh, them right away. On my right, we have Aparna Mathur, and she is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. She's come all the way from DC to be with us today. And we have Anissa Drabu, Landessa's National Communication and Advocacy Manager. We have Mirai Chatterjee, and I know Mirai is somebody most of you know. You all know the phenomenal work Sewa has done. So Mirai Chatterjee, member of the National Advisory Council and director of Social Security at SEVA. And you've all heard from Nena Lal Kidwai, of course. And she's somebody I think has, it's a bit of a cliche, but she really does need no introduction. So thank you all for being here today. And I want to begin right away with, uh, with you, Aparna. You know, most of us would think it's simple. Economic empowerment is the key. You get a job, you earn more and more money in your hand would equal to a reduction in violence. But I'm not sure the answer is as black and white as that. So can you walk us through some of your findings? Sure. Thank you, Malika. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, let me briefly explain what you know, the research that we've been doing, uh, which focuses on domestic violence issues and how women can escape domestic violence. And uh, the, we've been the problem with working with Indian data, and I, you know, I work in DC, and you know, we were, I'm an economist, and, and I'm used to working with large scale sort of household data sets. And the issue has been that we don't have enough data out there to address this issue properly. So, so there are two extensive data sets that we ended up working with. One is the National Family and Health Survey, which is funded by the ministry and uh, as an initiative of the Ministry of Health uh, here. And the other is the India Human Development Survey, which is a joint collaboration between the University of Maryland and NCAER. And both of, you know, those are the two data sets that we can look to, to sort of systematically study how, you know, what's the rate at which women get abused in domestic uh, situations. And the interesting finding is that when in the IHDS database, which is the Maryland uh, initiative, they, ask, they, they don't ask the women directly about whether they've been abused, they, because they know that the response rate is likely to be very low. So they ask, you know, is our beatings, wife beatings common in your community? Is it common for a wife to be beaten if she's not cooking food properly, if she's neglecting the children, if she, uh, you know, if the parents have not given enough money and jewelry? And the striking finding, and this is data for 2005-2006, is that nearly 85% of the married women in the sample report that wife beating is common in their community for any of these reasons. When we looked at the National Family Health Survey, which again asked questions about domestic violence for married women, 36%, and, and they asked them directly, have you ever been abused, you know, slapped, pushed, kicked by your husband? 36% of them said, yes, we, we have been physically abused. About 10% of that is sexual violence. And the problem is 75% of the cases go unreported. Mm -hmm. So when we look at data, you know, uh, Nena cited data from the National Crime Records Bureau, we know that there is tremendous underreporting. This is not the statistics. These are not actually representative of what's happening in the population. 75% of women never go to the police because they know that there is no chance that the case will ever make it to court. And then actually looking at conviction rates is, you know, is disappointing. So, uh, you know, so we started off with that. We said, OK, let's look at the sample of women, married women, who have faced abuse. And you know, which of them have managed to either escape abuse or you know, what, what is the demographic? of women who uh, report lower levels of violence. Yeah. Now, again, when we talk about economic empowerment, there are, there are three ways that we think women get empowered, either because they have a job, or, and secondly, they have high earnings from the job, or because they own wealth, like land. And uh, the NFHS data, the, the Ministry of Health data, has no information on earnings. They just do not ask questions about, forget about simply asking questions about women's earnings, they do, they do not have information about family income, which is like, the, you know, if, if you're trying to study, you know, are women empowered enough to, to fight back against domestic violence, against spousal abuse, 
you need to be able to at least say, well, these are, you know, are richer women or women who are more empowered in the sense that they have high earnings. They are the ones who, who face lower levels of violence. We simply do not have that information. So a lot of the research reports that we see out there, and, I, and I've seen a lot of them you know, doing surveys of the literature, you find that all of them report that women who work more tend to face higher levels of violence. In fact, you know, the, the interesting thing after the Delhi rape case was the reaction of a lot of the public. Where, well, you know, what was she doing out there at 8 o'clock at night? Did or, she invite you know, it upon herself? Yeah, did she invite it right. upon herself? You know, so if women are working more, if they're dating, if they're in malls and movie theaters, you know, isn't that just sort of inviting rape? Isn't that inviting abuse? And so the problem with working with the NFHS is that it feeds into that thinking because what it shows is that if you work more, you do tend to face higher levels of violence. In fact, when we worked with the NFHS data, we find exactly the same thing. And what we did was we said, well, you know, this is just one component of empowerment. Getting a job is one component of it, but we know that, you know, there, there are strata, there's stratification within that. There are women who earn a lot. There are women who earn in, you know, who are in occupations that, are very low income. So does it matter how much you earn? And for that, we, we looked at the IHDS data, and we actually find that if you have higher earnings, you tend to face lower levels of violence. You are, you are more empowered, and you face lower levels of violence. So, so it's not enough to simply, you know, ex sort of allow for, well, if, if you're working, then that's it. You, are, you will face higher levels of violence. Know that that's not true. Women who have full-time jobs, women who are in professional and managerial occupations, <coughs> tend to face lower levels of violence. And an interesting addition we did to that study was we said, well, let's, let's look at the Hindu Succession Inheritance uh, you know, Succession Act. And look, let's, uh, what, uh, till 2005, when you know, the gender inequality in inheritance was uh, at least removed on paper, by making da daughters have equal access to the ancestral property as sons. Before that, the, it was a very inequitable distribution in the sense that women and daughters did not have the same rights to the ancestral property as the sons. But what some states in the South did, and there were uh, primarily five states that did that, you know, Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Maharashtra, this, they made that change in the 1980s and 1990s, where they gave equal importance to the daughters and the sons as the sons in the inheritance law and when uh, and these laws were applicable to women who were, who got married after the change happened so we were able to exploit this sort of natural experiment that happened in india to study whether these women who were affected by the law actually had lower rates of violence and we do find that even in the nfhs data if you can control for that if you can isolate these women you find that there are lower rates of violence reported by these women. So I think inheritance legislation has done some good in making women you know, more cognizant of their, uh, of their rights, of making them more, giving them more bargaining status within the family and uh, uh, you know, getting them out there. So the traditional thinking has always been, well, you know, if women are earning more, uh, and it might, it might lead the husbands to retaliate through more abuse. Right. But what we find is that, uh, you know, that might happen, but in a lot of cases, it actually does help women get more empowered and get more bargaining status within the household. So it's more about earnings than it is about simply having a job. Than simply having a job. I mean, if you look at, you know, women who f sort of um, are ambitious and who yeah. aim for a career, who aim for professional positions, you, you, you don't find the same level of violence and incidents of violence in those cases. And as you say, you know, having a job is one component, but another huge component, I think especially in India, is owning property, isn't that? And property then, does property, owning property, act as some sort of protection against violence? Is that what you found in your work? Well, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to explain a bit about what land is sure. and we work on basically securing land rights for the yep. poor and and this we do by way of uh, doing a lot of research on ground, which basically guides our advocacy work that we do with the government and, and you know, kind of bringing together all the civil society organizations. And, uh, and one of the things that we found in our research is that 
definitely owning property is something that you know allows women to have more bargaining power mm -hmm. increases their decision making ability power and they can you know really invest in the future of their their children for example one of the things that landesa kind of uh, does and advocates for is having kind of you know uh, homestead plots and these are 10 decibels of land where you can have a small house and you can you know basically have some land where you you have grow vegetables as a vegetable yeah. garden and you can you have your livestock rearing and all that but that is allowing women and and especially you know when you have something like that it's important that the title of that land is in the name of the women at mm. least they're sharing it with their husband if not alone so that is very very kind of you know close and that's what we're working on and we found in our research the recent data we have from a research that we did with ifri was that uh, when we studied this in West Bengal and, and in Odisha, and we found that women were able to have more nutritious diet. They were able to have a, to kind of take decisions on what kind of land use there's going to be, what kind of land transaction, if there's going to be a loan or somebody's going to sell it, they were kind of consulted. And also the fact that, in fact, one of the very interesting things we found in uh, one research, one action research we're doing in Madhya Pradesh, and these are women from Pradhan self-help groups who, uh, who basically have you know, these micro enterprises, they are the earning members, they've come together, it's a very active self-help group. But they came up at, and, and kind of told people that we want to talk about land. And we asked, why do you want to talk about land? Because yeah. you already have, you, know, you are earning already, and if we compare you to the average rural women in others, you're probably you know, doing better. Yeah. They're like, then the men cannot drive us out of our homes. They cannot beat us up. So it's about the power, it's about the dignity, it's about the self-respect, self-worth. And it's not just how, the, how you see yourself as, as the owner of a plot of land, it's also how the families, extended families and the community looks at you when you are owner of this land, and there is this. And one of the things is also, I think we go, we, we also kind of go beyond, because we found in our work that some, uh, somewhere in West Bengal and Odisha, though women have these titles, but do they understand that their names are there on the titles? Just having a paper sometimes is not enough. And one of the things that Landisa does is to provide land literacy to women. Yeah. And we see that there are three conditions when a person can feel secure about land. One, you have the patta in your hand, the land title. Two, the records in the revenue record of rights, what we say, is matching with the title that you have. And three, that you're physically possessing that land. If one of these conditions is not there, then you're not secure in terms of having land rights. So we make them aware that if you have a land title, if your name is there, then you make sure that you're actually, and then you know, some of them are, oh, yes, you know, now we know. Or sometimes when you ask them, you know your name is on that, oh, we don't know, our husbands should know that our name is there. So I think it's also, it does, and in fact, I was in UP, uh, we're doing a project in UP, we're providing land literacy to women, and we're working on that. And one of the women came and said that, you know, my husband got drunk and all these men, you know, forced him to kind of give away land and he had sold it. And after three months, I came to know that the land has been sold. And then I went and with the help of this self-help group and one very active organization, she went back and there's a lot of negotiation. She took help of the, 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 the government. And, and finally, the land was given back. And now she's saying that, you know, nobody can get me drunk and take away the land from me. Right. I do uh, care about my children's future, and I, I can, you know, yeah. basically. And I asked her, I said, so, so you, now you have, you know, two daughters and two sons, who will yeah. you give this land? And now the land is in her name. And she's like, I know that I'll give it in my daughter-in-law's name and I, in my daughter's name, probably not in my son's name. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. huge yeah. thing, and it brings in that inheritance issue yeah. that, you know, how women, and I think when women find their names in the line title, and the change they see that it's bringing to themselves, they, they hope and they feel that, yes, it is something that, you know, can happen to my daughter or my daughter-in-laws. And so it's, yes, you know, it makes sense if they also inherit land. Yeah. So there's also that change that brings in, you know. So, so that's the kind of, I think we've seen it that, you know, definitely it has a link and it kind of leads to reduction in violence because it enhances dignity and all. And also one of the things that I would like to kind of mention that how do you bring in these adolescent girls, that age group where they understand, they're just imbibing, they're understanding, their whole understanding about issues, you know, society is just growing. And one of the very interesting work that we're doing in West Bengal is working with the, with the girls 
uh, where we, this is, there's a Sabla project, it's a, it's a program of a government program, where we have done, where we did a pilot saying that land-based livelihood skills or land rights training to these adolescent girls, we've seen that it's brought remarkable change in the sense how parents look at the girls, in the sense how boys look, because we are also working with the boys, we had, we're saying that it's important that your sisters have these rights. Do you, do you kind of, you know, uh, do, do, you, do you think that it makes sense? And, and, and I've, we've seen like interesting change, and now this program is being scaled up and it's kind of going pan. Absolutely, I think changing mindsets is absolutely key, and of course we will definitely talk about that, but I wanna go back to one interesting point you made, Aparna, which is, you know, it's about having a career, and right. women who are sort of slightly higher up in the socioeconomic strata, it does, empowerment means different things to them. And then I wanna bring you in here, because when we talk about aspirational young Indian women, the women who are going to college, uh, you know, women very much like Nirbhaya or the girl in, in Mumbai, you know, these are women who want to have careers, who want to be empowered, who in many ways want to be you, want to follow in your footsteps and rise in the corporate world in India. What role can the corporate world play, can the private sector play to help these women grow in an environment uh, of, uh, in a safe, in a secure environment? I think that's a great question, Malika. And uh, one of the big learnings I had as President Fiki uh, and clearly uh, inspired by the whole Nirbhaya incident was to look at what we had in place already as corporate India. And uh, I was actually dismayed to see how little we had as a country in terms of norms that needed to be in place across corporate India. I was fortunate, I worked with a multinational that had adopted best global practice and that already existed. So I lived in an environment which uh, you know, was pretty advanced in yeah. terms of what was in place here. And I hadn't recognized how poor that adoption was across a large part of India is family-run companies, and uh, that's about 70% of corporate India. The promoter-led uh, yeah. families. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and forget the fact that uh, ownership in family-owned companies goes from fathers to sons, even if there are daughters who are more equipped. So the whole mindset is very male-centric. Uh, these are not organizations that have adopted best practice in terms of an enabling environment for women. And uh, we've put into place now uh, a, a task force. I had my successor, the next president of FIKI, mm -hmm. actually chair it because I felt it was important to get led by my successor and a man. And he did a fabulous job. Uh, and we've pretty much now uh, uh, I won't say enforced, but we have encouraged all our members to adopt this as the to-do in place. So what should it be? Uh, and I would just call it you know, critical hygiene factors, uh, so that it's not just remains as a tick box exercise that it gets yeah. adopted with beyond that. And therefore, yes, it is about ensuring you know, equal pay and uh, the environment you create and that environment can be everything from where the loos or the bathrooms are, the washrooms are on the floor uh, because I've grown up in a culture where for years, you know, you had to go up two floors to go to a loo. You didn't even have a loo on the floor you worked and you can assess the hygiene of an organization towards its women in terms of how it treats its uh, washrooms for women. I can well, tell in a you way, that. it's an analogy it's to, great, where, it's to a, where the it's a great barometer. Yeah. So, what? So, so, it, it, you know, it's or about. Or it all, yes. And it's about, you know, uh, the, the creches, evaluation, percentages. I mean, there's a lot that goes into creating an enabling environment in a corporation, but there's a lot beyond it. I mean, we run at HSBC gender sensitivity programs. Uh, people coming in, they're coming from all walks of life. Yeah. Uh, very capable, able people coming from the best institutes, but yes, you try and assess it in a recruitment process, but that doesn't always suffice. And sometimes people don't want to do the wrong thing. They just need to sometimes be trained to, to do the right thing. And so there's a lot of gender sensitization that happens through role plays. And uh, I think it is bringing this, the mindset changes that are required, 
uh, the way you treat your women uh, from the time that you hire them to the time they leave. Uh, the policies, uh, you know, it's only recently actually that we stepped up our maternity policies to mm -hmm. six months leave, plus mm -hmm. you can take an additional six months uh, without it impacting uh, how you perform in the organization, so you can easily take a year off. Paternity leave, uh, recognizing adoption rules, putting creches in. These are all very new things that are coming into corporate India, uh, but it's important that we keep moving the needle on this. And we've got, uh, we've only as corporate India uh, started on this journey, and we've actually got a very long way to go. But we also extend it now to women as they move from home to the workplace. Mm -hmm. So helplines. Uh, do they know who they should call if in trouble? What is the response of the organization to that problem? Uh, hmm. BPOs and all who have women working late, and you know we, we run a lot of BPOs at HSBC, uh, have for ages uh, had women picked up and dropped, and certainly uh, after hours, even in our big towns. Uh, but it has to go to, it doesn't matter who you are, if you have a problem, can we have a 24-hour helpline that they can call, and that escalation has to be complete. And we do test checks on it because the helpline exists down at branch levels. So if, so if someone caught napping, so you have to, again, not just have a policy, you have to be able to ensure that it is implemented. And actually, unfortunately, it isn't always implemented the way it should. Is someone awake on the helpline to ensure that the escalation happens correctly? Uh, and today, there are, the technology is so fantastic. There yes. are uh, whole apps that you can yeah. have on your handheld which you don't actually have to call someone in, when in distress, that if the way you can trigger it, right. or the, the yes. way it can actually Track show you. where you are. These are things which we need to be able to disseminate, and many of these are available for free, to make sure that women know it's there. And we spend a lot of time in the organization instructing, informing, helping uh, how, how to uh, handle yeah. this. So it goes beyond the employee. Uh, after all, the target audience is not just the women who work with you. Yeah. For every guy who works with you, he may have a wife who's working, he may have a daughter, he may have a sister. That if you disseminate and you create an environment where people become sensitive to issues and also know how to help, you begin to get a wider audience. So I think taking it beyond just these are the women employees to looking at it as a community activity. Yeah. And my desire is we will take it to our suppliers, yes. uh, who we engage to supply to our organization, whether it's visiting cards or chairs or whatever, uh, should also have best practice. Yes. So that those that don't adopt these practices don't belong in your family. So you begin to use your influence to widen that search beyond it. You can't boil the ocean, but you can mm -hmm. start influencing mm -hmm. the things that you can influence. And you'd be surprised, surprised sometimes how wide that influence can be if you treat it as uh, a little bit more than just what is good for me and my employee, but in a wider community space. Absolutely. And that's what we can do in corporate India. And I want to now talk about the informal sector, which of course makes up a huge part of India's labor force. And Seva has done pioneering work, and you've been at it for a very long time. In your experience, when you've empowered women by giving them employment uh, in the informal sector, have you seen levels of violence come down with, in the community where women have jobs? Well, thank you very much, Malika, and it's wonderful to be here with so many sisters across different age groups and some brothers. Um, <laughs> I think the first thing I want to say is that the one thing we've learned in our over 40-year journey at SEVA is that economic empowerment is key. It's a first and very important step, and as you yourself noted, the abiding reality in this country for the mass of women is poverty. Mm. In fact, I would like to remind you that Gandhiji himself said that poverty is the greatest violence of all. It's our collective violence, it's society's violence on its own people and all the more so for women. So yes, economic empowerment is key. Um, 
economic empowerment, I just want to unpack it for a minute before yeah. I come to your question, is not just putting money in the hands of women. Of course, that's very important and it's transformational. So work security, employment, income security, regular work and income all around the year, very important for poor working women. But also economic empowerment only happens when there are other things in place. For example, she must have enough food to feed herself and her children, basic social security which has also already come up, Naina mentioned, uh, basic child care, daycare, health care, pension, micro insurance, housing as you said. Yeah. Women often say to us, they say it in Gujarati, so I'll say they say ke rotlo vagar chale, but rotlo vagar na chale. We can mm. manage without roti, without bread, but mm. we can't manage without a little angan or a roof over our head. It's as simple yeah. as that. It's not really that complicated. It's the basic roti, kapra, makan of life that is what leads to her empowerment. And then that when she has money in her hand, when she has her own bank account, when she begins to assert, this is my money, this is my earning, I will not give it to you, my drunken husband and so on. Yeah. That's when we see the transformation happening. And of course the transformation happens because she has a lot of sisters on the journey. Um, it's important for her to feel that she's not alone. I think this is very important and in a context such as ours when we're talking about violence against girls and women, it's important to understand that really in our society, in our patriarchal structure, it's very difficult for women to deal with violence, to buck violence, unless she has the support of her sisterhood and her right. solidarity group. So to come to your question, does a job or does work, actually we don't have jobs, we have work, work. does work actually lead to a decrease in violence? The answer is yes and no, it's a mixed picture. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not automatic. I mean, I said it's the first important step, but what happens is that money and work and uh, the future thinking that having money and work brings to the woman transforms, transforms her. Um, there's no going back. But the problem is that the men folk, her husband and others yeah. in her community are not necessarily transformed. And that's where the problem lies. Um, and I think we all have to do a lot more work on that and many of the colleagues on the panel have already mentioned that. What we have often seen, if I may generalize, and we can't really generalize, is that often when a woman is becoming so-called empowered and transforming herself, um, the violence goes up, in fact. We've seen this again and again. The violence goes up and up and up. She faces more beating, she faces more harassment. I remember one of my sisters, Saira Ben Seva sisters, um, she was a grandmother and her husband was following her regularly around to see who she was meeting, what meeting she was going to and she was regularly being beaten in the home. So the violence for Saira Ben and others goes up, then it seems to sort of plateau at a certain point. And what seems to do that is a couple of things. One is uh, when she has her own bank account and takes out a loan and brings a buffalo into the family and brings more income, that seems to have some impact. When there is the solidarity of her union or cooperative and other women show up and say, this is not acceptable, we will not allow you to do this. That's when that happens. And the third thing is that when she begins to be a leader and be respected, when she's asked to stand for election in the village panchayat, then he thinks, well, maybe this wife of mine is sort of okay. And that <laughs> um, sort of um, comes down a little bit. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, the importance of education and awareness. Sure. And several colleagues have mentioned this. I think those of us who sort of grew up in the women's movement in India and you know, it, we've been talking about the current context, but I remember as a 16-year-old when the Mathura rape case happened, yeah. that was also what galvanized many of us yes. and, and made us join the movement. And I think what we have not focused enough on is education and awareness with our sons and our men folk. Um, that's a major gap. But the good news is that it's changing. We recently uh, did a survey of the next generation. We are now onto the third generation of, of Seva children, um, daughters and sons. And we found that across the board, all the daughters said violence for any reason, even not putting salt in the khana and so on, is unacceptable. And about 95% of the boys thought that it was unacceptable. 
When we did a survey of their mothers and aunts and grandmothers, we were much heartened. And this is very different from 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. The mothers and grandmothers also said, 80% of them said, violence against women, physical, mental torture, anything is not acceptable. We still have that 20% to, to work, work on. <laughs> but um, this is what we found. Very interesting, and I think talking about mindsets is key. And I know today on the panel, we wanted to focus less on what the problems are, because we do know them. And we wanted to talk much more about what the solutions can be. Yeah. And I think I've heard them from all our panelists and seen everybody's head nodding the moment we talk about mindsets. And mindsets has to begin at a very early age, gender sensitization. And I have to say, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that it doesn't happen even in the schools we think it should happen in. I have little kids who go to a very prestigious school in Mumbai, and when I travel and I can't make it to a meeting, and I say, don't worry, my husband will be there, they're like, but what is he going to do? You know? And I'm like, if this is coming from these kind of schools, then that's, that's just plain wrong. And I know in your research, you've looked a lot at parents' attitudes towards sons and daughters. So yes. can you tell us a little bit about your research and what you found about those attitudes? Absolutely, Malika. It's, you know, the essential problem, again, goes down to poverty, as you said. So when yeah. parents have limited resources, and they think, and this is my interpretation, they, they think that they return on investment into a girl's education or, or a girl's health status or nutrition is not going to be that high, but if we invest in the boys, then, you know, we, we do get a high, high return. Then what you find is, and there's now a bunch of papers that have studied this issue, you see that the boy child gets a lot more time from the parents in terms of you know, investment in childcare, in terms of spending time with the parents, in terms of getting their vitamin, you know, the getting their vitamins, getting their vaccinations. Uh, you know, we spoke earlier about uh, treatments for diarrhea and other diseases. You know, boy uh, or, or the sons are more likely to get those treatments. The parents are more likely to take them to doctors and get them treated if they have limited resources than they are uh, for, for, the, for the daughters. Again, investments in education. And, and, I, and I also think that that goes all the way up to the time that the girl child gets married, because why are we seeing, you know, essentially child marriages, even at the age of 15 or 16? I mean, we, we know that the law says that they should wait at least till they're 18, but in our survey, in both of the IHDS and the NFHS data, we find 50% of uh, the women are getting married before the age of 18. And it mm. seems to me that the, the parents' perception as well, this is a burden, and uh, you know we need yeah. to hand her off to, to the in-laws, we need to hand her off to the boy's family, and here is the dowry to go with it so that they can now look after, look after the girl. And they don't think of them as you know, women who, can, uh, who are individuals, who can be educated, who can get a degree, and uh, you know, go out and work and earn, and have a life outside the marriage. So, so I think you know, changing that mindset, starting, as somebody said, from the crib, where you know the parents can instill into the girl child, no, you have, you are much more than a bride, is extremely important. And having you know empowering them at that age and having the you know the girl child think that okay, you know I have there is much more to me than the the marriage that's waiting to happen ten years down the line. Then I think that's very very important. It probably starts even earlier in the crib. It starts in the womb, doesn't womb it? When yeah. the, when yeah, when the womb when the yeah when they select the Yes, of I course, Nena. Want, I just yes. wanted to come in here on uh, how, and I take heart from the fact how quickly social norms can change mm. from one anecdotal case which I actually saw firsthand, and that was a factory outside Chennai, mm -hmm. uh, which made undergarments, interestingly, uh, owned by a Sri Lankan company, and 100% pretty much of the workforce were women. So it was, this was like a really upmarket tailoring <coughs> shop. Everyone did one centimeter on a sewing machine and passed in big production lines, and the supervisors and managers were also women. They were simple women from the surrounding villages who were recruited. They were given adequate nourishment, which was great. Mm. They worked there. Uh, there was high, high attrition because they childbearing, they could go off, etc. But the social norm that changed in five years was remarkable. Traditionally, women get married and they move to their husband's village. The men began to move into the women's village because of the economic empowerment of this factory. Five mm -hmm. years, that's all it took. So I think 
I mean, after that, it tells me that economic empowerment to help with the domestic violence, if it happens mm. at the early stages, if we can provide the sisterhood that Seva right. provides, yeah. that you do it en masse, that you, it's not you know, just an experiment here and there, you just go in and do it full-fledged, it's a percentage game, you've got the majority in there, it begins to change the norm. And uh, it wasn't even about land ownership, and yeah. all. it was just pure and simple jobs. And mm -hmm. the fact that these women earn, they were refusing to move because they wanted their yeah. jobs, yeah. and the men moved in, and they did it together. So you're transforming a community, yeah. society, a, a whole, village. I mean, imagine, you know, what a big norm that changes where traditionally women move to the home of yeah. their husbands, yeah? That's there was true. another, actually, yeah. if I could just add, there was of another course. interesting field experiment that I was reading about yesterday where uh, they essentially took women from certain villages, girls from certain villages, yeah. and they got them employed at, you know, the local BPO centers. And you could see that in the space of a few years, you know, yeah. the parents basically got interested in getting their girls educated because they realize, well, you know, now they can go out and get a job and be high earners. So, so if you can, you know, if they can start thinking of the, that there is a return to investing in the girls' education, then I think that's yeah. a great step forward. And, uh, you know, experiments like that show that, you know, parents are willing to make that investment if they can see a so return. So there is a change in mindset. There is a change in mindset along. that can happen pretty soon. And, you know, just uh, this year, we've seen that uh, the statistics have shown, this is at the IIMs, but that the women graduating from these institutes had multiples of jobs vis-a-vis -vis the guys, mm -hmm. and the under 20% that are women were in fact there because many of the corporations that went there wanted 50% of what they hired to be women. So if companies are going there wanting to hire the women, the women are gonna get the cream jobs, yeah. Yeah. and you are going to find this change happen. So we can all influence this change very quickly. So we've talked about uh, you know, transforming mindsets in the village. You've been in a unique position at SEVA where you've actually been able to lobby for policy change. And yes, we are seeing some changes at, uh, at the legal level with the new um, anti-rape laws, but it took a case like Nirbhaya to do that. What do you think does it take or has it taken in the past to actually get policy changes? Well, I think the first and important thing we have to share is the power of collective action, for mm. which Seva is quite known, uh, for organizing, which means when women across class, caste, community come together on a common platform to address their own issues. I think the biggest lesson, if <coughs> I may say it that way, that we have to share is that even poor, illiterate women can transform their families their communities, their urban and village communities uh, through the power of collective action, through collective strength, and as some of you have mentioned, because it enhances their bargaining power. Um, the other thing is that when women come together, we see that a lot of creative alternatives come up. Hmm. Um, I think the reason perhaps, or one reason why we have been, uh, we've had some success in policy work is first of all uh, the mass movement, the collective action, organizing and building a mass base. And second is because through this process, a lot of creative energies and insights have been released. Constructive alternatives have been developed. What works, what doesn't work. Policymakers always want to know what works, what doesn't work, and how much does it cost. And if you can provide them with some of these answers, uh, then, it's, then it's quite powerful. And I think the fourth thing is uh, the leadership of the poor women themselves. I remember when four finance ministers, that time the current Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was the finance minister of India, and three other finance ministers um, were sitting in a forum, and Chanda Ben, who was one of the founders of Seva Bank and an old clothes vendor, stood up and explained how, what money meant to her how important financial inclusion was, how essential yeah. it was to have access to credit, but not only access to credit, to have access to a safe haven for her savings, to also have access to pension, insurance, the whole sort of financial services bundle, if you will. Um, that, you know, that changed the thinking more than any other trips and meetings we had with the RBI government <laughs> and the bankers. <laughs> on that note, I want to quickly tell you one very quick story. and. Um, this was a story I did on rural banking a few months ago, and I went to a village in Maharashtra, and I was encouraged to see, Naina, that most of the people standing in line to open bank accounts were women. 
And uh, mm. after we'd filmed there a few hours, one of them came up to me and said, you know, can I tell you a secret? And I was like, sure. And she whispers in my ear, she says, you know, I've opened my bank account, uh, but I can't talk to you on camera because <laughs> I haven't even told my husband I've done this. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was That's marvelous and a yeah. good, you know. <laughs> And look, I have many more questions because I ask questions for a living, but it's your yeah. turn to ask questions. So I think um, Laura's going to, do, we all have pen and paper, and she's going to tell you how the process works, but we are going to continue this conversation, but with answers to your questions. So wrong to actually interrupt this conversation. I know that during the panel planning, this, this team came together several times to talk, and we decided maybe four or five hours would be appropriate for the amount of conversation and insights and whatnot. Um, but I apologize that we have so many of you in the room who have other deep insights on this very topic. Um, you have learned so much in this period of time, these 45 minutes where we've been talking about this topic, what we'd like to do now is turn to table conversations. This is time for you to engage with each other. And what we'd like you to propose is that you talk about what are the key things that you have learned this morning? Are there insights that came to you that you learned about um, that you didn't know before you had this conversation? And what was missing from the conversation? Is there something that, that you would want to put into this conversation? and share that with your table. Um, at the same time, some of our um, volunteers are gonna be coming around and asking whether you have questions for the panel. Um, I'd ask you to fill out, each table has a question slip. Would you please fill out your name, the organization you're with, who you'd like to address the question to, and the question, we will not have time for all of them but we will pick a couple of the meatier ones and we'll ask the panel to go to those questions. So please, it's over to you. We're going to um, give you about uh, 10 minutes for this conversation, and during that time, we'll be collecting your questions. Thank you. questions up here. I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but we'll do our best. So let's get right to it. This one says, I am a young Indian woman. I look at all of you who I aspire to be, as so many of us do. What's the one piece of personal advice you have for me to achieve economic empowerment? Anissa, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think one of the things that we've been talking about is that, yes, there are laws and there are this, you know, things that can help women. But I think it's important that women are aware about what is it that, you know, the law is kind of, what kind of privileges or what kind of things, is, things are there that can help women to kind of achieve that. For example, we have this inheritance law where, you know, you can inherit property, parental property, and there was an amendment made in 2005, and it goes beyond just the dwelling unit and says that in agricultural land also you can have, you have a share. But how many women know it? And it goes across the board. And I, I want to kind of say that it's not just about rural women. It's also about urban women. It takes them also, you know, in, in that. But how many urban women, whether you're educated or not educated, go up and kind of claim that, you know, this is the share that I want? Because, you know, we're scared that probably, you know, it'll, it'll severe the family ties or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's also about educating themselves and taking those steps, I think, to kind of achieve that rather than kind of saying, it's saying knowing that. Your rights, yeah, right? knowing your rights. There's another question that two of them uh, for Aparna, which touch upon the same, uh, same point, that the focus of the panel seems to be on rural and lower socioeconomic groups. 
However, violence is present in higher socioeconomic groups as well. And as we go up the social ladder, however, violence exists, but it's masked. It takes on different forms. Do you want to take that, Aparna, Absolutely. since leave that for you? Thank you so much for the question. I want to clarify that uh, you know we might have been talking a lot more about poverty and limited resources for girl children, but, uh, but the issue is actually something that crosses socioeconomic boundaries. Uh, you know, when we tabulated the data for by income groups, we find that the prevalence of reportings of beatings is equally common and widespread in the higher socioeconomic groups as it is for the lower socioeconomic groups. So this is definitely not something that is restricted to either rural India or uh, to lower socioeconomic groups. This is something that transcends uh, incomes, it transcends uh, you know, geographic boundaries uh, and so on. But I think what, what, what is important to highlight is that if you are uh, at higher income groups, you are more able, so, so let's say, you, you know, if you, if you did benefit from the inheritance law changes and you do have property, there is in, uh, evidence out there that suggests that you're more likely to move out of abusive marriages. There is evidence out there that suggests that you're more likely to marry at a later age and mm. choose your, your spouse who is, you know, not going to be abusive towards you. So, so there is definitely something to be said for economic empowerment, for moving up the income ladder. But you're absolutely right that currently there, you know, the violence uh, data suggests that this problem is more widespread than, it's not restricted to lower income individuals. Nena, I know you have a couple of questions. One of them was interesting about corporate hiring with some yeah. statistics over there if you yeah. want to take that. So, uh, this question from Preeti Chauhan is uh, to show that really corporate urban employment for women has gone down, which is so, from 92, 93 to, uh, from 15.5% to 13.8%. And uh, this trend was reported in the papers and it is disturbing mm -hmm. and I, I really, I, I do find it hard to accept. Uh, the fact is it's there and so what are we doing about hiring more women? And I fear that, uh, so at one level I talked about how the IIMs this year had many organizations that were there saying, we want to hire 50-50, even though the population of women was 20% on offer. So that's a positive. And these were the biggest and best companies. But at another level, I fear and that some of the rules and laws as we're bringing them and this consciousness about women and sexual harassment at the workplace is also being seen as a burden by companies. And the backlash is something we must recognize. I mean, I don't subscribe to it, but it's something we must recognize. So like with everything, we should make sure that we go ahead with a sense of balance. And it sort of ties into a second question which I had from Palak Bhatia, is sexual security at workplace relevant for male employees too? And how can organizations ensure that? And of course, it's an issue. So, one of the things that we wrestle with in companies today is can the sexual harassment rules, because they are so water, watertight in, in organizations like ours, they go beyond actually what the uh, Vishakha committee uh, mm -hmm. says, that if there is a case of sexual harassment reported and how we handle it is of course key, but the fact that you then nail the, the, the guy is a given, but can it be misused as well? And how does a male employee in the organization work with his female staff uh, is something which the norms, of course, have to be abided by, but does a woman who is on her way out because she's a non-performer mm -hmm. use this to stay in the organization? And how do we deal with that? And it's not going to be an easy journey as we move forward on this. And like with anything, there has to be a sense of fairness, of justice, of balance, so we don't swing from one end to the other. Because if we swing too far on protection of women, the backlash will be fewer jobs for women. And we have to be mindful of that. Uh, should I take the other questions quickly? Yeah. Should we and let me write? Yeah, yeah, then we, yeah. I know we're really sure. tight on yeah. time. So. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of questions here, but I can give quick answers. Um, one question is, why are women considered as lesser beings in society? They do not even have control over their bodies. And what can be done to change the mindsets in society? 
Mm -hmm. I think probably many in the audience would be able to very ably answer this. We do live in a deeply patriarchal and patrilineal society and it's been so for millennia. Uh, these are not easy things. And then as we heard this morning also, we have laws that perpetuate a gender discrimination that's being slowly overturned now. Uh, but it's a very complex issue. It's to do with our society. It's to do with the way all of us, even women and girls, are socialized. It's to do with our education. It's to do with work. Absolutely. Our work continues to be invisible, undercounted, uncounted. We don't get equal pay for equal work, even in the government programs like um, Manrega and so on. And what can we do about it? I think we all know the analysis of why uh, women are in our society uh, face gender discrimination, but what can we do about it? I think that's what we've been trying to speak to this morning. And I think several of us have said that we have to start very early, literally in the crib, um, from our daycare centers, from our schools, from our homes, sort of practicing equality, if you will. We have to be, as parents, uh, the role models. Um, I also mentioned the importance of education and awareness, not only for girls and women, but for boys and men folk as well. And how that slowly, slowly does show results, because there is enough evidence to now show that even in a deeply patriarchal society like India, the outside influences, what people see on the net, information technology, it all ha uh, plays its role, the media. Um, I sort of stressed a lot on the importance of pressure groups of women themselves coming together and organizing. Whether it's a freedom movement, liberation movement, or women's movement, changes happen when people have come together on a common platform and pushed for change. Change doesn't just come out of the clear blue sky. Um, we also over here talked a lot about economic empowerment. When women have money in their hands, when they have a roof over their head, when they feel they have choices, they can stand up and say that is enough and, and make their choices. So these are some of the things that would change the mindsets of society. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, the other question was, what about women who have been abandoned by their husbands? In India, the figure for female-headed households is about a third. Of course, not, they're not just deserted. Or, I mean, women who are deserted or their husbands have abandoned them but also women who are single mothers, women who are widows, and so on. And in Seva, we proactively try to bring these women into the sisterhood. They're part of our union, which is now 20 lakh strong. They're part of our 200 cooperatives, which are economic community sort of businesses, enterprises. Um, we try to help them go faster on the road to economic empowerment and have put money into their hands proactively provide them services like childcare, like basic insurance, and also encourage them to be leaders. And many of these women, because they have struggled, because they have faced so many barriers and obstacles, they are exactly the kind of material that become strong leaders and strong role models. Should I continue? There are one or two more. There's one question about, um, I mean, related question. You spoke of three-generation change in mindsets towards violence against women. Any learning on how the elders changed their mindsets and what motivated them to change? I think, again, without sounding simplistic, it was the sisterhood. It was the exposure of coming out of their four walls. That's what they say again and again. They say earlier, before Seva, before our own organization, we were like frogs in a well. Mm. Then we saw the outside world. We began to see that you, women have choices, too, that we can also be equal, that there's no need to be beaten. Um, and then, of course, we've talked a lot about economic empowerment, the power of that. And I think also something that we at SEBA have not done enough. It's sustained education and capacity building. We need to do much more. Um, education so that women understand and awareness that women understand that it's not normal to be beaten. If you see everyone around you being beaten and subjected to all kinds of harassment, you think that's the norm. Well. You know, we have to work hard so that we undo our cobwebs and we understand that that's not the norm. It's not normal. And that needs concerted and sustained education. So I think I'll stop there. No, I think, unfortunately, we're out of time. But everyone does have your questions. And there are some incredible uh, questions over here. And I think our panelists will be around a little bit longer. So I'm sure you can grab them when you're having tea. Malika, I have to take the privilege of sharing just to answer one question. Of course. It's come from uh, someone at Sriram School, Simran. 
and uh, it's disturbing. The biological privilege of being able to bear children and be insurers of the continuity of the human race has in fact become the burden curse of girls over boys. How should we encounter this mindset? Simran, you've got to understand that it is not a curse. The problem today is mindsets. And believe me, there are more and more boys and men that are sharing in this yes. continuity of the human race. So when you go out into the world, marry well, pick the guy who is going to let you work and be part of the parenting process, as indeed he needs to be. And it is a shared burden, and I would say it's a shared joy. I, as a proud mother, I have had the benefit of that. Equally, organizations today give you a lot more flexibility. Uh, the yeah. ability to even take off beyond the year I mentioned of maternity yeah. leave and uh, what you can take in terms of leave but also to leave the organization, stay in touch and come back when you're ready, should yeah. you want to have, and have made the choice for yourself to spend more time in parenting. So join the right organizations which yeah. give you this flexibility, whether it goes under mm -hmm. the name of flexi hours or returnee policies, as they are called. So not a burden, a joy, and clearly a great world out there. What inspiring words to end on. Thank you all so very much. Um, I echo your thoughts, Malika. This, this conversation is not done. It's far from done. So let's continue it. We're going to move into our breakout sessions now. Um, before we do so, I just want to make a reminder to you. These are, not, these are sessions that are run by you for you because of what you delegates have said that you want to talk about, who you want to meet through this conference. So this is your opportunity to make this conference yours. Please, if your session leader is taking all the airspace, make them stop. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a little bit of nu a nugget to talk about and, and to discuss, but ha make sure it's a discussion. Make sure that you get out of it what you need, and we're going to, and don't worry if you don't get to two or three, you, you, you obviously can only just choose one. We're going to have the breakout session, or the catalyst session leaders, um, come back and read out to us a little bit about what was discussed and how you can get involved in that topic if you didn't happen to sit in on that session. Um, so find each other, meet each other, um, use this. It's kind of curated networking. You already know that you want to know this about the same topic, so make it work. Um, I'm just going to read out and the locations for each of those catalyst sessions. And don't worry, there are, there are people around who can help you. But if you, are, if you have chosen um, the session on working with the men, um, that session is being held downstairs in Regency Room 4. Um, and you can, you, everybody needs to go out to the lobby and, and work their way downstairs um, to, to that session. Partnering with the government will be held downstairs in Regency Room 3. If you are in either of those two breakout sessions, if that's what you've chosen and selected, your tea is going to be in the room. So we're having a working tea. That'll get us back on schedule. Um, and if you're in the session, if you've chosen uh, can 20, 28 million girls say marry me later on child marriage, that session will be held in, board, in the boardroom on the third floor. Okay, so you're going upstairs when you get out to the, to the main lobby. Um, and the session on sex trafficking will be held here in the main room. Um, for those two sessions, just grab your tea and come into the room. You're, actually, if you're in upstairs in the boardroom, you're going to have to walk holding your teacup. So good luck with that. Um, thank you all so much. We look forward to re-engaging with you, seeing you at lunch, which will follow the Catalyst sessions. Oh, my goodness.